If you have your Bible, please turn with me to Galatians. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3. Last several weeks, uh, George and, and Pablo and myself have been slowly working through Paul's letter to the Galatians. It's probably best to work through it slowly because every verse seems to have about 25 different things that you could say about it. So uh, it's, a, it's a book that's best worked through slowly. But we are going through uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. Maybe no other place in the Bible is the black and whiteness of the gospel more pronounced more on display than in Galatians. We've got this very clear picture. Paul very clearly wants you to know what the gospel is and what the gospel is not. And as George said last week, the reason we're going through Galatians, the reason we need to go through Galatians, is to reorient our minds to the gospel. We are naturally prone to drift away from the gospel. We're naturally prone to go after things that aren't the gospel. And so we need to be reoriented all the time. So this morning we're reading Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 to 29. I encourage you, if you have a Bible, to follow along and to keep it open. We'll be referring to the passage quite a bit. So this is God's holy and inerrant and inspired word. The only perfect words I'm going to say to you this morning from Galatians chapter 3. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. What a glorious, glorious text. Let me pray and then we'll dig into it a little bit together. Heavenly Father, this morning I ask that those words would be worked into our hearts so that transformation might come, Father. I pray that this morning you would have any words that are not from you, that come from me, fall to the ground unheard, but that you would use me, an imperfect and fallible vessel, to deliver your word to your people. We thank you that it is not based upon my logical abilities, or my intelligence, or my ability to speak, that that The hearing of the gospel this morning is not contingent on any of that. Father, by your Spirit, you can and do work in the lives and the hearts and minds of your people through the preaching of your word. And so we ask that you would do that. Help us, Father, in this time. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. So what a passage this morning. There is so many sermons that could be preached from those 14 verses. Uh, And I'm going to try to preach one on all of them now. Uh, which is certainly an easy task. 
but I look forward to it. I'm excited about it because this is a truly incredible passage. Last week, George started us in uh, Galatians 3 where Paul introduces this idea of the law. Paul introduces this idea taking us all the way back to the promises given to Abraham and connecting them to what we have in Christ. This is an incredible chapter. Galatians 3 is often one of those chapters that gets brought up as people's favorite in the Bible. It's one of those kind of Romans 8 type pantheon chapters and, and I'm privileged to get to preach from it this morning. In a way, what Paul's doing in our passage today is, is taking out his phone, he's pulling up the Google Maps application and he's pinching his fingers together. Now those who have a phone know what happens when you pinch your fingers together on Google Maps, right? It zooms out. It zooms out. It gives us a zoomed out shot of the entire landscape that you're looking at. To put it another way, Paul's pulling a drone up into the air and he's giving us a, a, a picture of the whole landscape, taking us back to the very beginning of the Bible and guiding us through the story from Abraham to Moses all the way up to Jesus Christ. This is the story that Paul wants us to see. It reminds me of, uh, of those beautiful drone shots we had of Metaview last summer. I don't know if you guys remember those, but it was so cool to see our whole campus in, in just in those, those drone pictures. I asked for a drone. Cynthia said no. So, Just kidding. But anyway. So this is, this is what Paul wants to do. He wants us to show us that the entire course of redemptive history, this entire one story of the Bible is connected. This is not 66 separate stories. This is one long, beautiful story from beginning to end, the redemptive history story. And he wants us to ask one very important question to ourselves this morning. Especially if you're a Christian this morning, I want you to ask this question that Paul is pressing in. As you think of God's verdict regarding you, as you think of God's promise to you, is it written in pencil or is it written in Sharpie? That's the question of this text. Is the promise of God, the verdict that God has spoken true of you in Christ, written in pencil or in Sharpie? In other words... Is it written but erasable depending on what happens after it's been written? Or is it permanent? Is it unerasable? In other words, does your obedience to the law, does your life, does the different courses that your life take have any effect on God's final verdict? That's the question of Galatians 3. It's this whole idea that Paul's been pressing in, this doctrine of justification by faith. Justification, this glorious and beautiful word that God, this doctrine, God has declared us righteous. God has declared us not guilty. Not just not guilty, but righteous before Him. This is the idea of justification. Not because of anything that you or I did, but because of grace because of the blood of Jesus. So if you are sitting here this morning and you have a level of anxiety somewhere within you that is wondering if God is going to throw in the towel, or if you are sitting here thinking, I've been a Christian for so long and yet right now it seems like I am doing worse than I've ever done before, or if you're sitting there and you're thinking that I hope they don't discover that I'm a complete fraud. This passage is for you. This passage is for me. I know that for sure. But this passage is for you. If that is you this morning, if you have that baseline level of anxiety as you await God just kind of saying, it seemed like a good idea one time, but now I'm just not really that into it anymore. Don't call me, I'll call you. Paul is saying that's not how God works. Praise God, that's not how God works. That is what the Christian life is. The Christian life is the constant anxiety of wondering why you seem like you're worse off than you were before, but always returning to the glorious truth that God's verdict is written in Sharpie. Praise God. So I want to go through three points this morning. I've broken it down, hopefully helpful 
uh, for you if you're a note taker or if you just like to take a look at the road map, it's in your bulletin. The first section is the unchanging promise of God. The unchanging promise of God. We see this in verses 15 to 18. The first thing that the text shows us, and Paul wants to press in, is that God's promise is, was, and always will be the same. Has not changed a bit. George introduced us last week to this, uh, this law. We talk about the law in terms of the Mosaic law of the Old Testament. He reminded us that God's glorious promises to Abraham seemingly were kind of blocked by the law. It's almost like the law got in the way of the promises because what the law did was it, it set us under a curse. Set us under a curse. Not because the law itself is bad, but because we break the law. I illustrated this to the youth in Bible hours. I said, if your parents tell you to clean your room and you don't do it and you get in trouble, doesn't mean your parents asking you to clean your room was a bad thing. It doesn't make, we would love for that logic to apply, right? I would love for that to be true, but it's not. The reality is you didn't clean your room. That's the problem. The law is not bad. The fact that you break the law is bad. So you're under a curse. But Paul wants to further illustrate this. He wants to further let us into what the relationship is between the law and the promise because they do work together. They are both needed. What is their relationship? He opens up by saying that he's going to give us a a human example. Paul's going to launch into a sermon illustration, if you will. He's going to say that even with a man-made covenant, I want you to think of a will, last will and testament. In fact, that's literally what the Greek word is. No one annuls or or cancels it or adds to it. I think it's interesting that he says no one annuls or adds to it. Note that there's no addition or subtraction. It's important. No addition or subtraction once it's been ratified. Once it has been ratified. Skip down to verse 17. He says, the law which came 430 years afterward, after the promise, does not annul the covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. What does that all mean? Here's the picture that Paul wants you to have this morning. I want you to picture with me two bubbles, two giant bubbles, one bigger than the other, right? And one, the smaller bubble is subsumed into the larger bubble. Is everybody with me so far? I always try to paint these pictures and I tend to lose people. Ask the youth. They're very good at telling me that I've lost them. Big bubble, little bubble, little bubble subsumed into the big bubble. The way that we naturally go at the Bible is to assume that the large bubble is the law. Right? No matter how much we want to uh, rehearse our good theology and we want to sound like we are grace-centered people the reality is is that you and i are naturally disposed to look at the bible and ask the question what is god telling me to do the natural disposition is to go and ask what is the law we deeply believe that that's what the bible is and that's what the church in galatia was hearing from these false teachers the the church was hearing the fact that Yes, the gospel is true. Yes, the promise is real. But you need to sprinkle on a little bit of law in order to make the recipe work. You need to add a pinch of law. Just a little. And what Paul is saying is no. That's the wrong way to look at the Bible. When you come to the Bible, the big bubble is not the law. The big bubble is the promise. The big bubble is the promise. In other words, I'll paint another word picture if because it's helpful to do multiple ways. I want you to picture right above my head is the word PROMISE in all caps. P-R-O, and then little parentheses, LAW. M-I-S-E. In other words, the law is parenthetical to the promise. The law belongs in the promise. All right? So when you come to the Bible... And you see that God gives us instruction. We need instruction. Instruction is good and holy. Paul says that in Romans 7. We need instruction from heaven because we're foolish. But the law is always parenthetical to the promise. The law always belongs inside of the promise. In other words, your ability to obey does not change the promise. 
And that's what Paul's painting here, is that 430 years before the law was given, God gave a promise. And just because the law was given, that promise is the same. Nothing has changed about it. This is uh, what is truly beautiful about Scripture. We love to go to the Bible, and we, we, we naturally want it to tell us what to do. We like to go to the Old Testament, look at the Ten Commandments. Go to the New Testament, look at the ethical teachings of Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount, and, and see what Jesus uh, tells us how to live the life that, that, that His followers live, and that's good. Obviously, we need all of that. We can't forget that the promise is more important. It would be like my daughter Naomi thinking that the main reason Cynthia and I uh, had her was to tell her what to do. The main reason we had her is to tell her not to touch the dog's bowls and to put her toys away. That would be a terrible, terrible thing for my daughter to think that, and it would obviously severely hinder our relationship. The main reason we had Naomi was because we love her. The main reason we have her is to love her. She needs to hear, put your toys away. She needs to hear, don't touch the dog bowls. That's a good thing, right? That's necessary. But it is not the main point. And her ability to put her toys away and her ability to not touch the dog bowls doesn't change the fact that we love Naomi. It never will. In other words, the Bible is not a book of instruction. The Bible is a book of rescue. The Bible is not a book of law. The Bible is a book of promise. The Bible is not pick your toys up. The Bible is I love you. That's what the Bible is. The law always exists inside of the promise. And that's what Paul wants us to see. Before we can talk about what the purpose of the law is, before we can understand why the law, we have to understand that the promise doesn't change. The law had nothing to do with changing the promise. It's really a beautiful thing. And even, he adds this really incredible and, and, and cool point, which I would love to spend way more time on than I'm going to give it, but he even tells us what the purpose of the promise was, who the promise was to, who is the beneficiary of the promise. This is the really incredible thing. Notice he says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is such a curious verse, and so much could be said about the language and the nuance and and everything, but again, we're zoomed out. We're at the drone level view. I have to, I have to continue to remind myself of that because if I start poking into any of these verses, we're going to be here for the rest of the day. And I know we've got to go celebrate the fourth. That's what we all want to do, right? But anyway, the the point is that the beneficiary of the promise of God was not Abraham; it was Christ. The beneficiary was Christ. The point of the promise is Jesus. The purpose of the promise is to show you Jesus and to understand that in Him, by being united to Christ by faith, you too are the beneficiary of every single letter of the promises of God. Because we are co-heirs with Him. That's what Paul will go on to say. This is just mind-blowing, what Paul is getting at here. Not only was there a promise, not only was the promise unchanged by the law, but the promise was given, will be given to Christ as a beneficiary, and by being united to Him by faith, we receive the benefits of the promise. That is the gospel. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. So this promise is unchanging. Next, I want to look at the unexpected purpose of the law. Now that we've talked about what the promise is, what the purpose of the promise is, there is a logical question that follows. Fortunately, I don't even have to do it. Paul does it in verse 19. He opens verse 19 by asking, why the law? So why do we have the law? Why does the law exist? And he says something to follow that that's even more uh, maybe provocative, even more kind of, kind of wild. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. 
It was added because of transgressions. It's a provocative answer to the question, why the law? It was added because of your sin. That's why it was given. Until Christ came, we needed the law to be given for our own good. We like to look at the law like it's a ladder. It's our way to God, right? We descend up it, we get to God. What Paul is actually saying here is that the law is more like quicksand. The harder you fight in quicksand, the further you go down, the further in trouble you are. That's what Paul is saying the law is. It was added because of your transgressions. That's the, that's the point. Paul, or excuse me, George went in last week to the three purposes of the law, which the theologians have given throughout uh, the years. The three purposes of the law, a mirror to expose sin, a, a bridle to restrain sin, and a lamp to kind of guide our way. These are the three purposes of the law. We so often, the reason I called this the unexpected purpose of God's law is because we so often like to overlook that first point. But Paul is saying here that the predominant reason the law was given is to expose your sin. We like to overlook the fact that the law is a mirror, but the reason the law exists is to expose your sin. The same way you can find blemishes on your face, zits on your face, only by a mirror. You can only see how dapper or ridiculous you look in a bow tie because of a mirror, depending on where you sit. I'm just... I'm curious. I'm taking a gauge this morning. I'm just anyway. Like, <laughs> so, the unexpected purpose of God's law is to show us our sin, not to tell us how to get better, not to tell us how to find God, not to tell us how to be righteous, not to tell us how to follow the rules, but it is to show us why we need the gospel. It's to show us why we need to be rescued. Paul says in verse 22 that the Scripture imprisoned all the world under sin. And we don't often think of Scripture as doing that. We don't often think of that as being a main point of Scripture. But if you read Romans 7, for example, Romans 7 is a great example of, of a way that the Scripture imprisons us under sin. Paul says that he didn't understand the law, do not covet, until he realized how much he coveted. Until he saw his sin. Until his sin was exposed. A purpose of the Scripture is to imprison us under the law so that we realize we're so bad we can't fix the problem. You have to realize that. You have to see that. The next time you wonder this and you question your total and utter proclivity to sin, I want you to think of the last time you walked past a field and you saw a sign that said, Do not walk on the grass. And you think how much I wanted to walk on that grass. There's a sign in our neighborhood recently that somebody put up in their yard asking that you don't let your dog pee on the grass to respect their lawn. Every time I see that sign, I see the phrase respect our lawn and I'm like, I tell our dog Reevely, I'm like, I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to take him there, but if he decides to go, I'm not, like, I kind of want him to pee on that lawn. Like every time. This is the proof of our proclivity to sin. I want the rules to be broken. I want there to be law-breaking there. That sign really, really gets at me. I need to, need to move on. But anyway, this is the point of sin, is that we, we, we are naturally prone to it. And not only that, we're naturally prone to, to, to hide it. We're naturally prone to pretend it's not as big a deal as it is. We're naturally prone to try to look at other people and say, well, his problem is a lot worse than mine. So mine is not that bad. The zit on his chin is a lot bigger than mine, so it's really not that big a problem on me. I can, I can live with that. That's what we do with sin, and Paul is saying, no, no, no. The law is there so that you can see your zit is a big problem. doesn't matter what his zit is like. Your zit is a big problem. That's the point. John Stott writes this about the law and the gospel. Not until the law has bruised and smitten us will we admit our, our, our need of the gospel to bind up our wounds. Not until the law has arrested and imprisoned us will we pine for Christ to set us free. Not until the law has condemned and killed us 
Well, we call upon Christ for justification in life. Not until the law has driven us to despair of ourselves will we ever believe in Jesus. Not until the law has humbled us even to hell will we turn to the gospel to raise us to heaven. That's a powerful quote. This is what the law exists to do, and it is to show you your sin. But Paul says there's another purpose that the law serves that's, that's very, very significant, and he uses two metaphors. Again, Paul is all about the examples and illustrations here to try to help us understand. He goes to two metaphors in verses 24 and 25 that, that, that re- kind of relate to us the way the law uh, relates to us. The first is as a prison guard. Verse 24, he says that we are held captive under the law. The prison guard metaphor is relatively self-explanatory. could go a long way down that road, but I want to focus on the second one um, because that's, that's a really, really intriguing metaphor that Paul uses. He says in verse 25 that but now that faith is, or excuse me, verse 24, so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The word Paul uses there for guardian is the Greek word pedagogos. Pedagogos is the word there. What a pedagogos was, was back in this time, wealthy families would either, uh, either hire a, a servant or, or have a servant, or they would hire somebody outside the home to come in and basically raise their children. The pedagogos would be responsible for discipline, for instruction, uh, for, for all of this uh, so that the parent could, you know, could do their, do their stuff. They could afford it, so they brought somebody in to do this. The pedagogos would be responsible for all of these things until the child was brought to the age and maturity that they could go out into the world. And then the pedagogos' job was done. This was the idea. So this is, the, this is a really intriguing metaphor that Paul uses as he talks about the purpose of the law. Notice that the relationship between a child and this guardian, this tutor, uh, implies a lot of things. It implies, you know, certainly a loss of freedom. It implies an impersonal relationship. We do have that with the law the same way you would have with a prison guard. Those two things are related in that way. But there's also a very interesting thing that, that this metaphor gives us to say the law is not just about imprisoning us, but it's also instructive. It's also instructive. It works us towards a goal, towards a point. Um, and really, we can see the way this bears itself out as we mature in the Christian life. It's been long since a question, and Paul raises the question a ton of times in his epistles. If we are forgiven in Christ, we are justified in Christ, we are made new in Christ, then why do we need to follow the law? What is our relationship to the law after we've been saved? Do we, are we just free to go and do whatever we want? Are we just free to go and live the life that, that we want because we've been saved in Christ? And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, when I, was, when I was younger, and I'm not talking about anything nefarious, but when I was younger, I really wanted it to work that way, right? I've been forgiven, now I just get to go live my life. When I was a young Christian, that was, uh, that was something that, and I think for, uh, for many people, that's kind of an attractive thing. But that's not what our relationship to the law is, and that's not what the metaphor of, of a pedagogos points to that, of a guardian points to that. Uh, Tim Keller writes this, Is it the design of child rearing that when the child grows to maturity, he or she then casts off all the values of the parent or guardian and lives in a totally different way? Of course not. If all goes well, the adult child is no longer coerced into obedience as before, but now has internalized the basic values and lives in a similar manner because he or she wants to. In other words, as we're instructed in the law, the law as the guardian instructs us in the way of God, instructs us in the way of God's law, as we mature in the faith, We're no longer being coerced by the law, but we have been instilled with this law, so we live. That's what sanctification is. We live and grow in obedience, not because of coercion, but because of maturity. The goal of the law is not merely to imprison you. The goal of the law is not merely to expose your sin. The goal of the law is to instruct you, to mature you. 
to grow you closer to Christ, to grow you more like Christ. That is the point here. It's instructive, not just imprisoning. I think that's a pretty amazing metaphor that Paul gives. And so the unexpected purpose of the law, again, is not to give you a way to achieve righteousness, is not, an ab- uh, not a, to give you a way to know God and to get to God, not to give you a way to, to better your life or to earn prosperity or whatever the thing is. That's not what the law is. The law is given to expose your sin and to instruct you so that you grow to maturity, which is the third purpose of the law George talked about last week. It's a lamp to guide you to maturity in the faith. This is what the law is. It's the unexpected purpose of the law, and it's unexpected because it's somewhat counterproductive. We live in a very transactional world. If you work hard, you get paid. If you go to school and you work hard, you get good grades. If you follow on down the line, you guys know about the transactional nature of our lives. What Paul is saying is that this is not the way God works. It's not the way God works. God is not transactional. God has given you the promise which is unchanged by the law. It's given to those who would believe in Christ that we would be the beneficiaries of all that God has promised in His covenant. His everlasting covenant that will never change. He's given us the law so that we might know our sin and that we might grow into maturity of our faith. This is the purpose of what God has given. The law and the promise work together. But it's not just for the purpose of telling us what the law and the promise do. Paul ends this chapter with one of the most glorious paragraphs in the entire Bible. And that's the third point. The unimaginable power of the gospel. We talked about the, the pantheon of favorite chapters, favorite verses. Galatians 3, 20, uh, 26 to 29 is, is one of those highlight it, write it down, remember it, whatever you got to do kind of passages. Because what is the outpouring of this promise and this law? What, is, what happens as a result of these things if you're in Christ? So many avenues we could go down, but I want to stay at the drone level view, and I want to point to four things that Paul says are true of you if you're in Christ. And just as a side note, most of this I got from Tim Keller's commentary. I wanted to give him credit because he's going to... Cynthia said last night as we were reading, she read over my sermon and she said, Tim Keller explained this a lot better than you did. And I was thinking like, yeah, Michael Jordan dribbled that basketball a lot better than me too. But what are you, what are you, what are you saying? No. So I appreciated the comment. But, but this is, yeah, I loved what Keller said about this passage. I loved this paragraph. I love this section of his commentary. So I want to share it. Four things that Paul says are true of you if you're in Christ. Verse 26, Paul starts by saying, For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Notice first that he doesn't say that you will be sons. You are sons. This is so sure, so secure, so finished that we can talk about it like it's already true. That's mind-blowing as it is, but he goes on. You're not working towards something. You're not hoping for something one day. You're not looking to achieve something if you give the right amount of money or you wear the kind of clothes that you need to or you read your Bible enough or you unlock enough you know, youth group points or whatever. No, you are sons. The other thing I want to say about this is, is that I, don't, I want us to be careful not to be so quick to modernize the language. This is something that often gets done. I read a couple different translations of the Bible that changed this to, you are children of God. Which is a good and true statement, and I'm not trying to bash or hammer that. But don't be so quick to modernize the language. I realize that in our day, gender pronouns are a sensitive issue. I realize that uh, this is a very cultural thing that Paul would be saying sons. But I want you to indicate what Paul is saying by saying that you are sons. All of you are sons. This is a revolutionary statement. In that day, women could not inherit land. Women could not be the primary inheritors of their parents' possessions. Women could not... Uh, testify in court, women could not do all, all of these things, but it's really about that inheritance. When Paul is saying you are all sons of God, every single one of you 
can inherit the covenant, regardless of who you are. Women, this is an empowering statement that Paul is making. It's an empowering statement for all of us, but you need to hear that when Paul says sons, it's not because he's a misogynist. It's because he's making a powerful revolutionary statement of the role of women in this gospel faith. Truly incredible. Countercultural. Revolutionary. Unless you think, men, that we're getting off the hook, remember that we're all called the bride of Christ. So we all have our thing that we have to deal with. We are all the bride. We are all sons. Let's just bask in it. Deal with it. This is a beautiful thing. We are all sons of God through faith. Verse 27, the second thing that Paul says is true of you if you're in Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Paul uses another metaphor here. This is the clothing metaphor. Paul loves the clothing metaphor for a very particular reason. You are clothed. You put on Christ. There's so much that can be said about that. George used my favorite illustration a couple weeks ago, so I was kind of bummed that I didn't get to use it, so I'll give him credit for it, but I like to use it anyway. When you get into college, it's the first thing you go and do. You buy a t-shirt from the bookstore, right? You like to show off. I go to this college. I went to this college. There's no rule that says you have to wear the gear of the college that you went to. There's no rule that says that. Yet we all love to do that. Why? Because you identify with something. You're close to something. There is a There is an identifier there. It's very powerful. And this is what Paul is saying, but even to a higher level. You are clothed in righteousness. You are clothed in Jesus Christ. We are all wearing the clothes of Christ. We're all wearing the shirt. It's a pretty powerful metaphor. We're all wearing the shirt. There's a closeness implied there. Think about how close your clothing is to you. Is there anything in your life that's more close to you than your clothing on a consistent basis? Is there anything in your life that that gives you the level of security on a consistent basis that's not Christ other than your clothing? Think about the metaphor that's being made here. We've been declared acceptable by God. When He looks at us, He sees us in Christ's righteousness, clothed in Christ. The third thing that's true of you is actually a statement that's true of us. He says in verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Another radically profound statement. Radically profound statement. Verse 27 shows our closeness, Uh, or verse 26 shows our closeness to God the Father verse 27 shows our closeness to God the Son verse 28 speaks of our closeness to one another in the Christian faith there's not just a vertical aspect vertical relationship there's a horizontal relationship that flows out of the vertical horizontal flows out of the vertical and it's unity this is the point that Paul's been trying to get across if you go back to the beginning of the section on justification by faith Back in chapter 2 of Galatians, Paul tells a story about how he had to turn away or turn back Peter because Peter was forgetting what it means to be free in the gospel. Peter was forgetting this. He was falling into the trap of the Judaizers. Why is that important? Why is that kick off the section on justification by faith? Because the outpouring of all that Paul's going to follow with is unity in the church. What you were in your former life is now not relevant. We are one in Christ Jesus. Your identity, first and foremost, above everything else, is Christ. Everything is Christ. This is a truly incredible, profound point. And again, so much could be said here. There's so many implications. There's so many things for society and for gender roles and for racial reconciliation and all of that matters all of that needs to be talked about all of that needs to be gone through but it's just not what we have time for today and it's just not the point of this so i don't want to dismiss that i want to make sure that you know that i'm not dismissing that but i do want us to focus on what the point of the verse is in the context that it fits into and that is that when we are in christ we are unified together 
We are in unity with one another. We are more than just a club. We're more than just a country club that, that is paying the same dues and comes to the same place and eats the same food and plays the same golf course and all of that. We're more than that. We're more than just an organization where we, 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 we believe something the same way and so we're just united by our shared interest and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're more than that. We are united in Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are a powerful, living function through which Christ is working. This is an incredible statement of who we are. And the, the, the other metaphor Paul doesn't go to here, but he goes to constantly, is the, the metaphor of the body. And I love it. I said this to the youth a couple weeks ago. I love the metaphor of the body because what it means is all of you have a purpose in this body. And we are not as good if any of you are not here. That's what unity is. You might be a pinky toe, and I don't know what the... Well, pinky toe is actually important. You might be an earlobe, and I don't know what the actual purpose of earlobes is, but we need you. The body's not the same without you. It doesn't mean you're less important. We have different giftings. We have different abilities God has given us to serve the body, different spiritual gifts to build the body up. Every single one of you has a place here. Every single one of you has a purpose here. Every single one of you is needed here desperately. This is what it means. You're neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. We are one in Jesus Christ. The vertical flows into the horizontal. The fourth thing kind of puts a cherry on the whole Sunday. Wraps the whole thing up. Verses 26 and 27 talk about an upward movement, our relationship with God. Verse 28 talks about the outward flow, which is our relationship with each other, the unity in the body. Verse 29 reaches backward. We've got upward, we've got outward, and now we've got backward because Paul wants to wrap this all in a beautiful bow. He's going to send us into verse or to chapter 4. We're going to talk about a lot of this stuff a lot of the stuff about adoption and other things going forward. But Paul puts a beautiful bow on this in verse 29 when he says that if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. In other words, all of those promises that were bestowed upon Abraham back when we read it in Genesis 17 at the beginning of the service, going back thousands of years, across generational gap, across racial gap, across cultural gap, across historical uh, events, across everything that's ever happened, the promise that were given to Abraham are yes and amen in Christ. And if you are Christ, you are the beneficiary of all of those promises. And that's written in Sharpie. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing. We are heirs according to to the promise and the promise doesn't change the promise does not change this is an incredible statement we don't receive this because of our ability to keep the law you don't receive this because of your church background or your goodness or the fact that your parents are Christians or the fact that you have the right bumper sticker on the back of your car you voted for the right person in November or, or any of those things it's not based on any of that. It's based on the fact that by God's grace you have been invited to understand the glorious, wonderful beauty of the covenant. In a few minutes, we're going to come to this table. We're going to share of a meal together that remind us that we are indeed Christ's. As we feed upon the body and we drink the blood, we are reminded that we are not just brought to peace with God in an upward relationship, but outwardly we are unified in Christ. And we are reminded that because of the blood of Christ, we are heirs according to the promise. If you're feeling worn out and anxious this morning, don't give up. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. If you don't know Christ this morning, find what can only be found in Jesus this morning. 
find what can only be found in Jesus because all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. Let's pray.